we're uh, looking at what happens when Hamiltonians commute with time reversal. We actually haven't defined yet what the time reversal operator is, but we've listed a series of properties that it's supposed to satisfy. These are conjugation relations involving position, momentum, and angular momentum. Also, it has to be uh, uh, an anti-unitary operator. And one of the things we found uh, was that if the Hamiltonian commutes with a uh, time reversal, this is the same thing as saying that if you conjugate the Hamiltonian with time reversal, it gives you the Hamiltonian back again. What we found was is that the uh, is that the time reverse motion is the solution of the Schrodinger equation as long as the original motion un untime reverse was a solution. Here, the time reverse solution is defined. Psi r of t, the state vector as a function of time, is given by the time reversal operator acting on psi minus t. All right. So uh, this uh, closely parallels, parallels what we did in the classical case about time reverse motion. Now, uh, again, without saying, without saying uh, exactly what the time reversal operator is, uh, just using these properties, we can already say quite a few things about it. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by, getting, by giving you some examples of Hamiltonians that do uh, commute with time reversal, and uh, then we'll take it from there and look at cases where they don't. So uh, allow me just to do this here. Uh, first of all, uh, you'll recall that in the classical case, we found that particles moving in, charged particles moving in an electrostatic field, uh, uh, their, their motion was time reversal invariant. So let's start with that case. Let's say we've got a particle moving in three dimensions. In three dimensions the kinetic plus the potential Hamiltonian. In fact, let's make it 2 times phi. And phi is allowed to be a function of position for an electrostatic field. Now notice here that I'm not requiring this to be a central force motion. This is an arbitrary electric field here. Uh, but it's easy to see that this Hamiltonian is invariant under time reversal because if I conjugate it with theta, in the first place, the, uh, the momentum which appears in the kinetic energy is odd under time reversal. But since it's squared here, it means the overall kinetic energy is even. And the position vector is also even, so it doesn't change. And the result is the whole Hamiltonian is invariant in time reversal. So this, uh, and this closely parallels what we saw in the classical case of electrostatic fields. I'll say again, this does not require this to be a simple force Hamiltonian. Now, um, the uh, easiest way to break time reversal invariance in a Hamiltonian like this is to uh, put the system in an external magnetic field. Because if you do this, of course, the kinetic energy now becomes 1 over 2m. Then you have the momentum p minus q over c times the vector potential, which is a function of position, and the whole thing is squared. And if you now conjugate the time reversal, the momentum term will change sign. It's odd, it's odd in the time reversal. Whereas the vector potential being a function of only a position is even, and so if the uh, Hamiltonian does not go into itself. Again, this closely parallels what we saw in the classical case as well. Now, on the other hand, uh, as I remarked earlier, if the magnetic field is internally generated, that's to say if you include the charges and currents that produce the electric and magnetic fields as part of the definition of the quote-unquote system, then uh, time reversal invariance is restored. This is a reflection of the property of uh, the fact that the electromagnetic, electromagnetic interactions are invariant over time reversal. So to speak of an atomic problem, for example, uh, let's talk about the spin orbit term. The spin orbit term has the form of a function of the radius times L dot S, as we've discussed previously. And it's a magnetic interaction. It has to do with the magnetic energy of the electron uh, as seen in its own, uh, as seen, uh, well, it's due to the, due to the magnetic field uh, as seen in its own rest frame due to the uh, motion of the uh, nucleus around it as seen in the rest frame of the electron. Um, notice that f of r is, is certainly invariant under time reversal because the position vector is. L and s are two angular momenta. The uh, conjugation relations for j here actually applies to all types of angular momenta, orbital and spin. So both L and s are odd under time reversal, but their dot product is even. And the result is that this Hamiltonian, even including the spin orbit term, is invariant under time reversal. So this is a, a, an example of an internally generated uh, magnetic field. Similarly, by the way, if you have the hyperfine interactions, they are proportional to I dotted into S. The hyperfine interaction, uh, for example, with <coughs> hydrogen is the interaction, magnetic interaction of the electron spin with the magnetic field produced by the nucleus. And one of the terms in it is proportional to I dot S, where I is the nuclear spin and S is the electron spin. But you can see that this is, this is also even under time reversal for the same thing as, same reason as L dot S. It involves 
the black one with the two angles on the inside. All right. Sorry, is it, is it has its own argument for the ending that magnetic term and it still violates the term or so? Excuse me, what's the question? It has L.S. and it has the del A term. Do it have the A term? Yeah, the A term. Yeah, well, if the A term is coming from an external source, then, then yes, it would violate time reversal. If the A is coming from an internal source, then this is actually a function of the position and, and, and it's really the velocity of the particle, you know. So, so, that, so then time reversal variance is, 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 uh, is it actually holds for the whole system. You don't see this in atoms like hydrogen because the... Um, uh, there, well, just, let's see, what am I trying to say? Um, the spin orbit interaction is, uh, as I said, is the interaction of the, uh, yeah, so the situation is that in an atom like hydrogen, you don't have any vector potential from the nucleus because it's stationary, so it doesn't, it doesn't make a magnetic field apart from that. It makes a magnetic dipole field because of its spin, but it's not a current in motion, not in the lab frame it isn't. And so there's no magnetic field in the lab frame due to this motion. However, you go to an atom like helium, then both electrons are moving and they produce magnetic fields. And then you get a, not only a spin-spin interaction, but a spin, it's called the spin-other orbit. Spin orbit, up, it's not the same orbit. It's a spin of one electron with the orbit of the other electron. If you put all the pieces together, you'll find it's still invariant under time reversal. Okay? All right. Now, um, so now the question it, uh, that, that arises is, uh, are there any examples of uh, Hamiltonians that involve electromagnetic fields, uh, which are purely internally generated, which do violate time reversal invariance? Does that happen? And the answer is yes, I can show you an example of that. Uh, let's, take a case of a, uh, let's take a case of a nucleus, just a, uh, you can just think about a nuclear, uh, nuclear spins, so the cut space for the nucleus, as we're used to, is the span of the spin basis states. That's him, that's him like this. And um, as we know, if you place this in an external magnetic field, you get an interaction which is minus mu dot b. This is an energy of the dipole in an external field. I'm not gonna wanna, I don't want to consider that because that's certainly not invariant under time reversal. Uh, it, uh, uh, Actually, I beg your pardon, it actually is in very much. Anyway, let me get to the point. The point is, is that uh, let's consider the possibility of an electric dipole moment of the nucleus. The, inter the energy of interaction, let's call it delta H, for an electric dipole moment is minus D divided into the electric field, where D is the dipole moment, with, in this case, of the nucleus. Now then, uh, the electric field in question could be an external electric field for simplicity, let's suppose it's that. We're placing another nucleus in an external electric field. Now, uh, what about the dipole moment vector? Uh, as you are hopefully learning from this week's homework exercise, is along this uh, Hilbert space here, this spin Hilbert space, which is a single irreducible subspace under rotations, uh, you find that all vector operators are proportional to one another. And in particular, for example, the magnetic moment operator has to be proportional to the spin. Well, this is the usual thing we've seen earlier with G factors. But this is the explanation for it. It comes from the big neck heart there. Likewise, the dipole, electric dipole moment operator, if it exists, must also be proportional to the spin. Let's write it as K times the spin, where K is some constant. It has to be so on this, on this uh, Hilbert space. And so this, thing, this interaction becomes minus some constant times the spin dotted into the electric field. Now, if we uh, subject this to, if we, if we conjugate this with time reversal, uh, the, uh, the electric field doesn't change because it's a function only of position. However, the spin does change, and the result is this is an odd term. This is odd under time reversal. Now, the result of this is, is that if time reversal is a good symmetry of the Hamiltonians, then the nucleus cannot have an electric dipole moment. And in fact, it's known that time reversal is uh, obeyed to a very high degree of accuracy. In fact, as far as anybody knows, it's exact in the case of nuclei. As well as other, this also doesn't have to be a nucleus, it could be an elementary particle such as the electron. And so there's a question also about the possibility of electric dipole moment for the electron. The argument is the same. If there is, the dipole moment operator must be, uh, uh, must be proportional to the spin. And so this is the interaction in an external field, and it's odd under time reversal, not even. 
So time reversal invariance excludes the possibility of an electron dipole moment, or for that matter, a dipole moment of nuclei. This is why in the case of nuclei interacting with external fields, we're interested primarily in the quadrupole moment because that's the first non-vanishing term, assuming time reversal invariance. Now, of course, it's an experimental matter to detect whether or not uh, the uh, term like this exists. Uh, it can be said that, uh, first of all, such terms have never been discovered, uh, either in nuclei or in, in, in so-called elementary particles, but it's not for lack of searching. In fact, there's been strenuous efforts to detect these delicate experiments because they involve very high precision. Uh, some of these have been carried out by uh, uh, Professor Cummins and also Professor Booker in this department, especially Cummins worked on this for a long time, uh, establishing upper bounds on the electric dipole moment of the electron. If you saw his colloquium just uh, a week ago, you uh, heard something about this. In any case, the situation is that, um, is that the um, standard model does not exclude such an electric dipole moment, but, it, but uh, based on the, um, the numbers that are known from experimental data and in the given standard model, if such, an, uh, if such an electric dipole moment exists, it's extremely small and way smaller than anything that's been ever been measured up to this point. However, the standard model is certainly not the end of the story, and, and there's question about physics beyond the standard model, and some of the hypotheses or guesses for such physics would give rise to an electric dipole moment that's uh, considerably larger than what you get in the standard model. So these experiments are ways of probing physics beyond the standard model, in which there's a great deal of interest these days. All right. Uh, let's just say that all that's been done up to this point is established upper bounds. Uh, for the electron, I think the number is that the quadrupole moment is, excuse me, the dipole moment is something like e times 10 to the minus 27 centimeters, or let's put it this way. It's about 10 to the minus 27 e centimeters, uh, where e is the charge of the electron. And my recollection is that's the order of magnitude of the number, it's something like that. So, all right. All right, so that's electric dipole moments. Now, um, as I said a moment ago, up to this point, we haven't actually said what the uh, what the uh, uh, what the uh, uh, time reversal operator actually is in any specific system. So let me uh, turn to the simplest case of that and explain what uh, what the dipole moment, excuse me, what the uh, time reversal operator actually is. Uh, the simplest case to take is that of a spinless particle moving in three dimensions, for which we just have a simple wave function psi of r like this. The time reversal operator, whatever it is, has to satisfy the given commutation relations. And as I discussed in the last lecture, we can factor this in what I call the LKD composition into the product of a linear operator times a, an antilinear operator chosen for simplicity. And in fact, the antilinear linear operators that are chosen in practice are usually these complex conjugation operators that apply in a, in a particular representation. In the present case, the obvious representation to use is the position representation, so those are the position eigenkets. So let's let k here, let's let k here in this context be the same thing as we'll all take, call case of R, and it satisfies the condition that it maps the position eigenkets into themselves, like this. And I'll remind you that this doesn't mean that k is the identity because k is antilinear. It does, however, mean that k is equal to k dagger is equal to k inverse, and so it's in fact an anti-unit, an anti-unitary operator. Well, um, so uh, let's uh, begin the search for theta by just looking at the k part, and let's see what the k part does to the desired uh, uh, conjugation relations which are here, in particular the position of momentum. Position must be given momentum odd under time of time. So uh, let's first of all look at this. Let's look at what the uh, k R k dagger is for R as the position operator. Actually, allow me to put a hat on this to indicate the operator here. A hat now means operator and not unit vector. So we're interested in this product of operators. Well, one way to do this is to take a uh, wave function psi of R and just apply these operators in order, working from right to left. We first, apply k dagger. K dagger is the same thing as k because it's a complex conjugation operator. So this just turns into a wave function of psi of r complex conjugated. Then we'll apply the position operator, r hat. That's equivalent to multiplying by the position. So it just turns into r times psi of r complex conjugate. And then we'll apply k again, which is just the complex conjugate. That takes us over to r times psi of r. 
because the position vector is real, it doesn't change. And you see the effect of the product of these three operators is just to multiply the wave function by the position vector. That's the same thing as the effect of the unmodified position operator itself. And so you see the position vector actually is, um, is uh, unchanged by the complex conjugation operation. As far as the momentum is concerned, this is, of course, minus IH bar, VDR, in the position representation. And since we just decided that the position itself is invariant, uh, all that all that you have to think about here is the I, uh, since a, a time reversal is uh, anti-unitary, this means the I change is sign. And the result is, is that if you conjugate momentum, it goes to minus itself. And these are exactly the desired con uh, con uh, conjugation relations uh, that we have for time reversal. Uh, by the way, to take a cross product of R times P, this gives you a medium of K, L, K dagger for the orbital angular momentum is minus L. And we require that all types of angular momentum be odd over time reversal. Anyway, the net effect of this is that the complex conjugation operation alone satisfies all of the uh, conjugation relations that we're requiring. Uh, in addition, it's anti-unitary. So in this, in this LK decomposition, we really don't need the L, or you can set L this linear operator equal to 1 if you want. And we just end up with a very simple rule, which is that for such systems, spinless particles in three dimensions, is the time reversal operator is just complex conjugation of the position representation. And it's actually the wave functions is just given by complex conjugating the wave function. Psi bar goes over into this complex conjugate under time reversal. Uh, this is a very simple rule, which is easy to remember, and it applies to a lot of cases in practice. Uh, by the way, it's easy to generalize to multi-particle systems with no spin. You just complex conjugate the wave function. That's all there is to it. Okay. You get the uh, time reverse wave function. All right. Now, I want to, um, in a moment, uh, talk about time reversal and systems with spin. But before I do that, let me make some remarks about time reversal and energy eigenstates. Let's suppose we have a Hamiltonian which commutes with time reversal, and let's suppose it has an energy eigenstate so that h psi equals e psi, like this. And let's look at let's let's see what effect a time reversal, uh, what time reversal can tell us, time reversal invariance of h can tell us about this. Let's take both sides of this equation and multiply through by the time reversal operator on the left. So on the left hand side I'll have theta times h. And then I'll insert theta dagger theta, which is equal to identity, because theta has to be anti-unitary, acting on psi. So that's the left-hand side. But we're assuming that h is invariant at the time reversal, so this becomes h theta psi. And then applying theta to the right-hand side, I can pull the theta through the energy E, because E is a real number, so it's complex conjugates equal to itself. And this becomes E times theta psi. <coughs> And then putting in parentheses just to make the emphasis that I want, the result of this is that the time reversed state is also an energy eigenstate of the same energy. So this is a rule that's easy to use, maybe easier to say in words, is if you take an energy eigenstate of a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian and you apply time reversal to it, you get another energy eigenstate of the same energy. All right. Now, it doesn't change the energy in other words. Now, um, it's, it's, it's logical that it should do that. Now, uh, let's make this a more special, more special case. Let's suppose that this is a non-degenerate state, energy eigenstate. Uh, then in that case, since theta psi has the same, it's an eigenstate of the same energy, it must be proportional to the original state. Some proportionality factor I'll call C, because there's only, it's only one dimensional eigenspace. Uh, now, what can we say about this constant C? We can determine it, we get a condition, it turns out it's a phase factor, and we can show this by squaring both sides of this equation. This will be a little exercise in using antilinear operators. To square the left-hand side of the equation, I first convert this, this, uh, this cat here into a bra. To do that, I write it backwards, like this, and dagger everything. And I also need to keep track of the parentheses, because now the theta is acting to the left, the theta dagger is acting to the left. As far as the original cat is concerned, this is theta psi like this, and I'll put parentheses here to indicate that theta acts to the right. 
uh, squaring the right hand side, we just get the absolute value of c squared, assuming that psi is normalized, which I will assume that is plus psi psi is equal to 1. And we just get mod c squared. Now, on the left hand side, this theta dagger acts to the left. If I reverse the direction in which this acts, which is what I'd like to do, is to make it move over this way, then I need a complex conjugate to make itself. That's one of the rules of any linear operators. So the left hand side becomes psi like this, and then theta dagger theta applied, applied to psi, with now parentheses indicating that everything works that way. But then I have to complex conjugate it. And that's the another way of writing the left hand side. However, theta <coughs> theta, theta, theta is just the identity. So this just turns into the square of psi, which is just one. So the complex conjugate just turns it into one. So the whole left hand side is just equal to one. And the result is, as I said, is that c becomes a phase factor. So for a non-degenerate energy eigenstate of a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian, we can say that theta acting in that eigenstate gives us a phase factor, which I'll now write as e to the i alpha instead of c multiplied psi. Now allow me to take this equation and multiply both sides from the left by e to the minus alpha over 2. When I take the e to the minus alpha over 2 and commute it past the theta, it becomes complex conjugated and becomes e to the plus i alpha over 2. So the left hand side now becomes theta times e to the plus i alpha over 2 times psi. And on the right hand side, the e to the minus alpha over 2 combines with e to the plus i alpha and gives us e to the minus i alpha over 2 times psi. And now what you see is, is that this original eigenstate multiplied by e to the i alpha over 2 is what you might call it an eigenstate of, of time reversal. It's mapped into itself by time reversal. Yes? Plus alpha. It should be, yes, thank you. It should be plus, thank you. Um, so, uh, so uh, it becomes, so, so, so if I let, if I call this, if I just call this state phi like this, then what we have is, is a theta acting on phi is equal to phi. And so the statement here is that uh, if you have a non-degenerate energy eigenstate of a time reversal invariant system, then by multiplying by an overall phase, you can make the eigenstate itself invariant under time reversal. In a particular case of uh, one or more spinless particles moving in any, actually it doesn't have to be 3D, any number of dimensions, uh, the, uh, this would say, this result, in the next case they call the time reversal operation is just complex conjugation. This result would say that you can always make non-degenerate energy eigenstates real uh, by multiplying by an overall phase factor. This is a fairly trivial conclusion because in those cases, the uh, Schrodinger equation, the time, the, time, the, the eigenvalue problem, the time independent Schrodinger equation, uh, is a purely real equation, so naturally you can find real eigenfunctions. But this, is, uh, this puts this in a more general context uh, for uh, any system that's time reversal invariant. All right, <clears throat> so that's a, actually kind of a small result. Now, uh, let me turn now to the question of time reversal in the context of spin. I'll get you on the board for this. For simplicity, we'll start with the case in which we'll ignore the spatial degrees of freedom and look only at the spin degrees of freedom. I'll say the spatial degrees of freedom are not important. So uh, this means, again, that we've got a open space, which is the span of of uh, states as in usual spin states like this. <coughs> All right. Now, here there's a spin operator. The spin operator is the angular momentum for the system. And like all angular momentum operators, this is required to be odd in the time reversal, so if you conjugate it, it goes into minus itself. So this is the basic relation, this basic conjugation or conjugation relation which we have. Uh, it's also of interest to, uh, form it, to, to conjugate the raising and lowering operators with a time reversal. If I take the raising operator, for example, as xs plus isy, and if I uh, conjugate this with time reversal, the spin components sx and sy will change sign, but the i also change the sign because of the complex conjugation. And the result is this turns into minus sx plus isy, same thing as minus s minus 
So to, so to combine this together, uh, we can say that minus s minus is equal to theta s plus theta dagger. Let me, let me box that part of it because that's the part I want to use. <coughs> All right. Now, let's take these basis states SM and explore their properties under time reversal. In particular, let's apply the time reversal operator to the basis state SM. We don't actually have a definition of time reversal yet. We're going to work on that, but we're starting with the required uh, with required conjugation relations to see what they apply. So if theta acts on S and what can we say about that? Well, one thing to do is to allow J Z to act on, on that, on that state, and see what you get. If we do, we can pull the J Z through the theta, but because it's not J Z, it's S C, excuse me. S C. We can pull the S C through the theta, but if we do it change the sign. So this turns into theta times the minus sign, minus theta times S of Z acting on SM. And now the S of Z brings out M, and so we get minus M times theta acting on SM, uh, SM like this. And so what you see is, is that theta acting on SM is an eigenvalue of S of Z with an eigenvalue of minus M. And the result is, is that the time reversal operation changes the sign of the magnetic quantum number. Logical, because it changes the sign of the operator, SZ. And so, theta acting on SM, I mean, there is only, in this, in this Hilbert space, there is only one vector with an eigenvalue minus M. So this has to be proportional to that, with some proportionality factor I'll call C, S comma minus M. It must have a relation like this. And in fact, based on what I said so far, there's no reason why the C couldn't depend on the particular magnetic quantum number. So I'll put a new subscript on that. And in fact, we'll find out in a minute that it really does. By the way, it's easy to show by squaring this, both sides of this equation that the, uh, the CM is a phase factor, so its absolute value is equal to 1. I won't go through that again, but anyway, these are, these are phase factors. Now we can get further information about these Cs if we use raising and lowering operators. Allow me to take this final, this last equation here. Let me apply, uh, let's apply S plus, a raising operator to both sides. So on the left hand side, we get S plus times theta acting on SM. And I'll, I'll work on the left hand side for a while. If we pull the S plus through the theta, it becomes minus S minus. So this becomes minus S minus, excuse me, minus theta times S minus acting on SM. And that becomes minus theta times our famous square root, which is uh, s plus m times s minus m plus 1, uh, acting in the state s comma m minus 1, with the m, m, m quantum number has been lowered by 1. And now we can bring the theta through the square root, which is real, without changing the square root. And when we do, the theta is adjacent to s comma m minus 1. But from the equation above, that's going to bring out our constant C, so it will be C sub m minus 1, and it will also change the magnetic quantum number. So this becomes equal to the overall minus sign, the same square root. And then we get C sub m minus 1 times the state S comma minus m plus 1, having time reverse the state. Now that's working out the consequences of applying S plus to the left hand side. If I apply S plus to the right hand side, CM is <coughs> constant, so I'll bring it through. And so this is equal to CM times S plus applied to S comma minus M. And if you work that out, that's CM, and you get another square root here. And the square root is the square root of uh, S, uh, it's S plus M times S minus M plus 1. And then we have to raise the magnetic quantum number, so it becomes S comma minus M plus 1. Okay? Now, if we compare this result here, which I'll circle, excuse me, this, this version that came out of the left-hand side with this version that came out of the right-hand side, those two are equal, you see the square roots are the same, so I can cancel them. You can see the cats are the same, the same state, s comma minus m plus 1, so I'll cancel them. And what's left over is a relation among the coefficients. Cm is equal to Cm minus 1 with a minus sign. I'll put it up here, write it like this. 
c to the n minus 1 is equal to minus c sub n. And so as I said, these, these, these phase factors which occur here from applying universal with these states do depend on them. And whatever they are, they change sign as n goes up and down. So for by recursion, every time you, you, as you move m up and down, you get a factor of minus 1 for every step. And that means in particular, if we're starting from the lower stretch state where, where m is equal to minus s, we can say that c sub m is equal to c sub minus s times the factor which is minus 1 to the s plus m power. You can see this is the right solution because if I set m equals minus s, the minus 1 term cancels and I get c minus s equals c minus s. And you can see otherwise it goes to minus 1 to the m and change the sign for every m increment. Allow me to write this as c sub minus s times i square root of minus 1 to the power of 2s plus 2m. Uh, I'll do this for a reason I'll explain in a minute. But if I do, then this becomes c minus s times i to the 2s times i to the 2m, where I factored it into the part that depends on s and the part that depends on m. I want to write it as i like this because the magnetic quantum number can be half integer, and it's convenient to have only, only work with integer powers because for, if it's a half power, then you worry about the sign of the square root. So this, this keeps track of, uh, there's no ambiguity about what this means, no square root ambiguity. In any case, the first factor here depends only on the spin of the particle, and the second factor depends on the magnetic quantum number. Allow me to write this first part just to call it eta, just to give it a name like this. And if we now put these pieces together, here's what we get for time reversal acting on these basis states at SM. It is that it's a, it's a phase factor eta times i to the 2m times s comma minus m, like this. And this is the basic conclusion we get by using nothing but the required uh, conjugation relations of time reversal with the spin operator. And uh, this gives us information about the phase factor that's introduced when you, uh, when the magnetic quantum number is split by the application of theta. Uh, this this factor eta, as I just indicated, depends only on s in the sense it's a characteristic of the particle. Uh, but it's actually not even as, as important as that because it turns out that it's completely non-physical. Uh, the, the, first, the first thing to say is, is that it doesn't affect any of the conjugation relations because those all involve theta, theta, dagger, and so the eta is going to cancel out. And there's actually no physical consequences to this eta, and you can set it equal to anything you want, any phase factor you want. In fact, there are different conventions in the literature, and I don't care which one you want to use for any of your applications. You can set it equal to one if you want to. All right. But in any case, this is the action of time reversal in spin states. Now, I'd like to approach this uh, same problem of time reversal in spin states from another point of view. It's useful to have both of them. This is the first point of view here, using, uh, using uh, conjugation relations, commutation relations. Here's a second point of view. Uh, again, it's the same Hilbert space, it's just a spin space, it's, it's up in the board of uh, Let's consider the an LK decomposition of the time reversal operator as we did earlier with the case of the particle uh, in the spin. The K is the complex conjugation operation on the wave function in some representation, and we need to say what that is. The logical one here is the S of Z representation, because that's just the basis space we're using up there. So let's do this. Let's take the, let's take the complex conjugation in the S of Z basis, and let's see how far we get if we if we apply it to the here they are the desired commutation relations. Well, for spin, there, for a purely spin system, there is no position of momentum operator, but there is an angular momentum. So this is the main one we concentrate on, and of course it's supposed to be anti-unitary. So let's just work on the K itself, the complex conjugation operation, and see what we get when we conjugate. J will be identified with spin. So that's the strategy. So let's do this. Let, let, let just, just for gravity here, let's call this K. Well, I'll do it this way. Let's take this case of S and Z, and let's take the operators S, <coughs> S, Y, and S, Z, and arrange them in a, in a column like this. And in the case of S and Z dagger, let's look at this. All of these complex conjugation operations are all, all of them are, are anti-unitary. Uh, They're all anti-unitary. In fact, their square is equal to 1. 
clear you come or come here twice, you, you, you get an identity. <coughs> now, what happens when we conjugate the components of spin with this complex conjugation operation? The answer is easy to see if you think about the matrix representations of these operators in the standard angular momentum basis. The matrices for Sx and Sz are purely real, whereas those for Sy are purely imaginary. This is a consequence of the phase conventions that we established in the standard angular momentum basis. And the result of this is that under this conjugation, this complex conjugation, uh, Sx and Sz go into themselves, uh, but Sy changes sign, so you get a minus sign in the Sy. Well, this doesn't give us what we want, because what we want is that theta acting on S multiplied by theta dagger should take you into minus S. In fact, all three components should change their sign. And so in the case of spin systems, the time reversal operator cannot be simply complex conjugation. There's got to be more to it. There's got to, we need a linear operator that's going to make things come out right. Well, such a linear operator is not, <coughs> not hard to find. <coughs> if we draw spin, spin space like this, Sx, Sy, and Sz, the effect of the K, as you see here, was to change the sign of S and Y, so it flips over like this, the Sy changed sign, but Sx and Sz did not. <coughs> However, if one leave the SY alone, not change that result, which is still good, yes? I'm sorry, how do we know that SY is a sign? Because the matrix for SY is purely imaginary. Oh, okay. In the standard phase conventions. Okay. Yeah. Whereas those for SX and SZ are purely real. You can see that for the poly matrices, but it's also true for any value of spin, not only one half, but all the others as well. Okay. So we flip the sign of SY, but now we need to flip the sign of SX and SZ as well. Um, uh, and uh, one way to do that is to perform a rotation about the y-axis by an angle of pi, which I think you can see will flip those as well. So what this gives us then is we'll identify the linear operator L here with the rotational uh, u of, of y hat comma pi, which is equal to e to the minus i pi y component of the spin divided by h bar. You can write it out explicitly. And so we'll do this for spin systems. We'll say, let's take this system, purely spin systems. We'll say theta is equal to e to the minus i pi <coughs> over h bar times the complex conjugation in the k and z basis. And this is actually a satisfactory definition of time reversal operator for, uh, for, uh, for uh, pure, purely spin systems. Now, basis, on the basis of what was done here on the upper board, this time reversal operator here, the theta, must have this form up here for some choice of the phase factor eta. With a little extra work, you can actually do that and find out what the eta is. I won't go through it because it's really not important. Um, the, uh, the point is, is that the two approaches actually give you, give you a compatible results. All right. Now, uh, having obtained this for a pure spin system, it's now easy, easy to guess at least what the time reversal operator should be for a system where you have both spatial and spin degrees of freedom. Now, the basis gets the usual ones we would usually use would be, uh, would be R and M, like this, which is the tension product of a position eigenkett times the SM eigenkett for the spin. And in the case of the pure, purest uh, position, in the, case of, in the case in which the position operator alone was a complete set, we just use complex conjugation and the position representation. So it's logical that for a system like this, we should take this time, this data here, and just multiply by complex conjugation and the position representation. In other words, what we do is we complex conjugate the entire wave function, both position and SMC. So this would mean that theta here for a system like this would be equal to e to the minus i pi s y over h bar, the, the usual rotation about the y axis, still y axis, times the complex conjugation in the position and s sub z representation. And in fact, this is the satisfactory, this is a satisfactory definition of time reversal for a spinning particle. Notice that this is only a spin rotation, it's not a total rotation of the system. We don't rotate the orbital degrees of freedom. Only the spin. Uh, you know, there's a there's a question here. Uh, time reversal by itself doesn't have anything to do with any particular coordinate system or directions in space. And so you might wonder why in the world we have a rotation about the y direction. What's special about that? 
Well, the answer is there's nothing special about the wide direction except for the fact that it was picked out by our phase conventions that we used when setting up these ang standard, standard angular momentum bases. And um, that's, that's an eigenbasis of S of Z, but there's also phase conventions involved. Remember, these complex conjugation operations depend on the phase conventions for the basis states. In any case, uh, the result is, is that although the linear operator and the antilinear operator in which we factor theta do involve the directions, in this case y and z, the product of them does not, it's actually, in a sense, rotationally invariant. It is rotationally invariant. It's independent of any orientation in space. All right. Now, um, this result for a single spinning particle, a spin, is it's easy to generalize even further to include uh, multi-particle systems with spin. The particles don't have to be identical. They can have different particles, can have different spins. Some can be fermions, some can be bosons. Think of the helium atom of two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus and two electrons. Well, that's six, <coughs> six fermions, if you want. All right. Um, the, um, or if you think of the alpha particle is just a single particle. It's one boson and two fermions and two electrons. All right, in any, case, uh, in any case, this is easy to generalize. All you do is you just apply a spin rotation on all the spins. So you just use the same formula here, except that SY is now interpreted as the sum of all the particles of the SYIs. It's the total Y component of the spin. And the K here is interpreted as a complex conjugation of the wave function and the combined position in S and Z basis for all the particles, just by reinterpreting this equation. Okay. This now leads to an interesting conclusion, uh, which maybe I have a space to do it here. You'll recall that uh, a moment ago I explained that if you have a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian and an energy eigenstate, let's call it psi, so that h psi equals e psi, uh, is that we found that if you apply time reversal to that state, uh, you get a uh, you get a another you get another um, uh, you get another uh, uh, you get another um, eigenstate in the Hamiltonian with the same energy. All right. Uh, so in particular, this is equal to c. So let's see. So you, you have the same energy. In particular, if this is non-degenerate, if this is non-degenerate, then theta acting on psi must be some constant times psi itself. <coughs> we showed that was a phase factor. In fact, let me call it a phase factor. I'll write e to the i alpha for it. It's a repetition of, of uh, this result we derived a few moments ago. Now, let's take this the second equation and let's apply time reversal a second time to it. Let's multiply through by time reversal. So on the left-hand side, we get theta squared acting on psi. So this so to recapitulate a little bit, this, this applies to any non-degenerate eigenstate of a Hamiltonian, which is time reversal invariant. Now let's apply theta uh, to, again. So on the left-hand side, we get theta squared. On the right-hand side, this turns into theta times e to the i alpha times psi. We can bring the theta through the e to the i alpha, but if we do, we have to complex conjugate it. So it goes into e to the minus i alpha times theta acting on psi. Theta acting on psi gives me e to the i alpha times psi, so the result is this just turns into psi itself. And so what we see is that for such a system, theta squared acting on psi brings back psi itself. It's thought psi is invariant under theta squared. All right. For any non-degenerate energy eigenstate of the time reversal invariant system. Now, on the other hand, we have this expression for the time reversal operator in general for now spinning any number of spinning particles. Let's take the square of this. Let's take the theta square. Uh, let's write this. This becomes e to the minus i pi s y over h bar times this k. I'll just write k for it. Times e to the minus i pi s y over h bar times k. It's the product of these, these operators. The K operator actually commutes with this, uh, with this linear uni unitary rotation. The reason is that the matrix for SY is purely imaginary, but up in the exponent it gets multiplied by I. And so this is an example of a Y rotation. This is one of the lowercase d matrices, which are purely real. So the K will commute through that. And if we do, we get K squared. The K squared is an identity because you complex conjugate twice, brings it back to the identity. So all that's left is the product of these two rotations, and we end up with e to the minus 2 pi i s y over h bar. 
this is a spin rotation by an angle of 2 pi about the y-axis for all the particles. Well, if the spin a quantum number is an integer, then a rotation by 2 pi brings you back to where you started from. It's just 1. If the spin is a half integer, then a rotation by 2 pi gives you a minus 1. This is this minus 1 in rotating electrons by an angle of 2 pi. And so this operator is equal to minus 1 to a certain power, which I'll call, let's call it nu here, where nu is equal to the number of fermions in the system. So for a system that has an even number of fermions, the square of the time reversal operator is plus 1. Otherwise, it's minus 1. But over here, we said that if we had a non-degenerate energy eigenstate of a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian, then theta squared applied to that would give us psi back again. You see, that's inconsistent with, with this result if you have an odd number of fermions. And so the assumption that we had a non-degenerate energy eigenstate must be false. And so the conclusion is, is that in any time reversal invariant system with an odd number of fermions is that the energy eigenstates are necessarily degenerate. In fact, with a little more effort, one can show that degeneracy is always an even number. Uh, this is called Cromer's degeneracy. And it's, uh, it's a rather, I mean, time reversal is, 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 of all the symmetries, time reversal is the oddball because it's anti-unitary. Any, uh, any so there's nothing like time Cromer's degeneracy for the other other uh, symmetries, but this is, uh, this is one of the, this is the main, one of the main uh, results you get from time reversal. Uh, if you want an example of Cromer's degeneracy, it occurs in this week's homework. Sakura, I asked you about this uh, problem. You have a spin three halves particle. Notice that it's an odd, uh, that it's a half integer spin. A spin three halves nucleus in the presence of an external electric field. And the problem is to work out the energy levels uh, of that and, and due to the quantum pole interaction. And uh, then he asks, is there a degeneracy? Well, it's a 4 by 4 matrix, so there's four eigenvalues, which you'll find they come in, in doublets. There's two pairs. And this is actually, this is actually a nice example of it. It's a single fermion. So the inter and it's, it's also time reversal invariant because it's a, it's a, it's a quantum pole interaction in an external electric field. So it's an example of Cromer's degeneracy. I'll give you another example. If, if we took, um, I'll give you another example of Cromer's degeneracy. If we took, uh, let's say, the ordinary hydrogen atom, so the Hamiltonian is uh, p squared of 2m, and then the minus z squared over r, like this, the ordinary hydrogen atom. Now, this is in an electrostatic model for hydrogen, so we're ignoring the spin. Uh, but the spin is really there. The electron is a spin one half particle. So, Congress and Generacy would say that all of the energy levels should come in doublets. Uh, this is true if you count the spin. It's kind of obvious because the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on spin, so spin up and spin down have to have the same energy. That's why it's always a doublet. To make this a little less trivial, we can add the spin orbit term here. Which really does bring in the spin. And in that case, spin up and spin down. Now the two components of spin are coupled. Um, however, it's still true that the energy levels come in, come in doublets, again, because of time reversal invariance. We can fix this, we can make this even more elaborate. Let's put in an external electric field. Let's put in uh, a minus E times a, an external potential, which can be an arbitrary external potential function of position. It doesn't have to be a uniform field. The energy levels will still be in doublets because of commerce degeneracy. So these are uh, examples of this. All right. I have one, one final remark about, uh, about uh, time reversal, and that is the question of CPT and CP violation. Uh, CPT, CP, and T are three uh, symmetries. Uh, the uh, pair of T is parity, and T is time reversal. Uh, that's what it stands for, CPT. And C stands for charge conjugation. We, haven't talked, uh, we talked about time reversal and parity, but not charge conjugation. The reason is that you need relativistic quantum mechanics to properly understand charge conjugation. Nevertheless, the basic idea is, is that that's an operation that maps particles into their antiparticles and therefore changes the charge of them, electrons and positrons, for example. Um, it is believed in, in uh, quantum field theory that, uh, that all quantum fields uh, should be uh, relativistically or, or, should be or covariant under Lorentz transformations and also that they should only involve local interactions. 
And on the basis of these assumptions, it was proven by Pauli in the 1940s, what's called the CPT theorem, that says that the product of charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal altogether is an, is an exact symmetry of, of, of any such quantum field. Uh, and so CPT invariance is, is widely believed to be a, 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 an absolute, a, absolutely valid symmetry of nature. On the other hand, uh, as, I, as I explained uh, in a previous lecture, it's uh, known that uh, parity is, is violated in the weak interactions. This was shown in 1954. Um, so um, what about the other symmetries, such as uh, C and, and T? What in particular, what about time reversal? Well, 10 years later, in 1964, it was shown experimentally uh, that there is a violation of the product of CP, the CP product, in the K of the K mesons, the neutral K mesons. There's a whole story about that, an interesting, interesting piece of physics. In other words, CP violation was discovered. Well, if CPT really is a true symmetry, and you've got CP violation, as has been proven experimentally, then it follows it must be also a time reversal violation. Recently, there's been uh, some more experimental work on CP violation in the, in the, in the B mesons, it's supposed to be so-called the bar of B factory at Stanford, and there's been a, a good deal of greater insight obtained into CP violation just in recent years. Uh, so it's indirect evidence through your one's belief in the CPT theorem that there's also a time reversal, a violation of time reversal invariance. Now, um, I'll just mention one more thing before we go, which is that uh, there's uh, current speculation that it was a violation of time reversal invariance in the early universe that gives rise to uh, the imbalance between matter and antimatter. The universe that we live in, of course, is mostly matter, as far as we know. Um, based on anything anybody knows, there are no antimatter galaxies out there or anything. There's, there's some question about that. But um, you certainly can't have a mixture of the two because they would annihilate. Uh, in any case, so the current belief is, is, that, uh, is that the matter in the universe was created in the very early moments of the Big Bang. Basically, it came out of gravitational energy. And um, the matter and antimatter were created in almost equal, um, uh, uh, equal amounts, uh, with a small, uh, a small difference between them due to, due to T violation. And then as the universe cooled off, the matter and antimatter annihilated one another, leaving behind a small residue of matter, which is everything that we have around us, including ourselves. So this is, uh, this is the current speculation on uh, the state of, uh, of uh, the early universe and time reversal invariance play, plays a role in that. Okay, that's all. That's all for today.